Good morning, church. You know, in our journey together, we have encountered a word. They may be new to us or at least new in frequency. And that word is transformation. And we come to this place with all kind of different associations. For me, transformation was something very different. It was becoming something you're not. And um, I know others have encountered that drama and they've found some comfort in those great church words. We've never done it that way before. But I have come to know in a very powerful way the transformation's not that. And God has placed in my lives, in my life, yeah, I'm getting there, I'm like a cat. <laughs> Some very powerful people who have taught me that transformation is a wonderful blessing. The person I'm going to introduce today, I really didn't know two years ago. But in that short time, her witness and her faith have taught me that transformation means listening a little bit more. It means seeing a little bit more. And it means loving a lot more. Pastor Yvette Davis, my friend and my colleague, has taught me that transformation isn't something different. It's something more. You have the article before you, and I'm not going to spend time sharing that again. But I am going to share with you my friend, my colleague, who has given me a great gift, an ability to know God in a more transformational way. Pastor Yvette Davis. Ooh, my mother would be so proud. She might say, was that man talking about you? And frankly, I have to ask that question myself. Thank you so much, Charlie. You truly have been a friend and a great support, and I praise God for you. Bishop, cabinet, members of the Susquehanna Conference, good morning. Good morning. And let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, that sounds nice. That's a Holy Ghost roar. Amen. Well, as Charlie said, I have only been in the Susquehanna Conference for two years. And since I have been here, there is one question that people ask me all the time. How do you wear those shoes? Yes, they are fabulous. I know you were thinking it, but I took the liberty of saying it. But I wear them after lots and lots of practice. Hallelujah. However, if I happen to fall off these shoes this morning, those of you who are not laughing, and I will probably be laughing too, that'll be fine. But those of you who are not laughing, I need somebody to pick me up and somebody to pray that I did not break something that I will need. <laughs> Amen. Let us pray. Amen. 
Gracious God, we just give you praise this morning. We exalt your holy and wonderful name. We adore you, O oh God. And Father, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our hearts this morning. We ask you, Lord God, to fill this campus with your presence. Fill this space with your precious Holy Spirit. And we ask you, Lord God, to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive what it is that you would have us to receive. And Father, I give you praise this morning that we are not depending on me. We are depending, Lord God, on your precious Holy Spirit and what it is that you would have us hear that you are speaking through your holy scripture. And we ask you, Father, that you give us a heart and a mind to submit to the work that you want to do in all of us today. In the name of our true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And Lord, as I pour myself out, I ask you to fill me to overflowing and put the language in my mouth to speak. In the wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ's name, we praise you and we thank you. Amen. 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 This morning, we are going to take a little journey through Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to read through to uh, verses 31 to 46. But we're going to focus more on the side of love and obedience and spend a little bit more time talking about what it is to be the sheep in Christ's pasture. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit helps us to see. And we're going to talk about who are the least of these. When the Lord sets the least of these in our path, do we recognize them? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal to us who are the least of these? Now this passage of scripture is very important to me. It has been a major part of my life and it is still working me. I am an urban practitioner. My passion is for ministry in the city. I was born and raised on Long Island. I was raised by who I like to refer to as the Black, Red, and Scarlet. <laughs> they are, my father is from Mississippi. My mother is from Georgia. They both grew up on the farm. And as soon as I discovered the city, my heart was captivated and to the consternation of my mother, I hit the city and hardly ever looked back. So whenever urban practitioners, folks who have a passion for city ministry get together, we have these conversations and it is inevitable that we start talking about Matthew 25 and who are the least of these. But let's begin with the passage. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Let's, there you go. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. 
Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Now let's read verse 40 together. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And now I'll continue to, uh, to verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. This parable is talking about the final judgment and how the sheep, the faithful, the righteous, the followers of Jesus Christ who are submitted and committed to their relationship with the Lord and being more like him. And then the goats, the rebellious, those who are not committed to Jesus Christ, they are placed at the Lord's left and they are sent into the eternal fire. And I love the message that Reverend Sprinkle taught during the clergy session on Thursday morning and he emphasized that the choices that we make have consequences. And this morning, we can choose Jesus Christ and submission to his will and his way or we can choose to go our own way, to go the way that is against him and that follows Satan and his minions. But this morning we are going to talk about the obedience, the love, the righteousness, being followers of Jesus Christ. Now I want to share with you, I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior back when Christian was cool. It was back in the day when everybody saw the image of Jesus in their French toast. And there was a fish bumper sticker on every car, which was very ironic and amusing for me because I was born Methodist, got saved through a Baptist church, grew up Pentecostal, returned to the Methodist church. And during my Pentecostal days, I attended a church with 3,000 people in regular attendance just on a Sunday morning. And it was always a trip for me to watch folks coming out of that parking lot after service using language that was not heavenly and gestures that did not praise the Lord. <laughs> but every bumper sticker had a little fish on it. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Now, during my Pentecostal days, it was, not, it was not uncommon for pastors to preach about sheep. And they, also, they used to talk about how sheep are not very intelligent. And yet, that metaphor is used in the word over 500 times. Jesus is referred to in scripture as the great shepherd. He is also the sacrificial lamb and the lamb of God. And when we are born again, the Lord changes our name and he writes it in the Lamb's book of life. How many of y'all have your name in that book this morning? Glory to God. 
and that's where it should be. So how can sheep be stupid? How can sheep be dumb? Talk about bad theology. But glory to God, I took advantage of this opportunity to really find out more about the characteristics and the nature of sheep. And so, and once a librarian, always a librarian, I naturally had to do a little research. And by the way, it was knowing that my name was going in a book that attracted me to Jesus. How prophetic was that? <laughs> and so I would like to introduce to you a consultant with the University of Maryland. May we meet George, please? <laughs> Amen. George is a good Christian Republican. He was named after George W. Bush. And according to his bio, he is very proud of that. It is not that kind of party, so we're not going to address that. But George has been a consultant with the University of Maryland since he was three weeks old. He is a mixed breed sheep. He just celebrated his 12th birthday uh, back in March. And he works with uh, Susan Schoeninger, who is the goat and sheep specialist at the University of Maryland. Who knew there was a goat and sheep specialist somewhere? And essentially, the University of Maryland trains people who want to become shepherds. They train the future farmers of America on the characteristics of sheep. And George has helped in that education. And I could share so many different facts about sheep. They could go on forever. But we're going to zero in on the three most important characteristics of sheep. The first one is flocking. Sheep need to feel that there are at least five among them in order for them to feel comfortable and not feel agitated. They need to be in the company of people that they know, of sheep that they know. They understand the, the importance of relationships. They understand even more so that a five-threaded bond is not easily broken. When the predators come, that is their protection. That's part of their protection. And they stick close together. Brothers and sisters, we all need to be in fellowship with fellow believers to strengthen us and edify us. The word says that iron sharpens iron. And as we go out into the world, as we are growing as disciples ourselves, when we go out into the world, we will have folks who will not only help us with finding other sheep, but also to help to strengthen us to speak life and speak the word over each other. The second key characteristic of sheep is hearing. They depend very, very heavily on their gift of hearing. When they hear something, it hits two different points in their ears. They can hear very crisply. And that's very important because back in the Bible days and even today, depending on the size of the flock, the shepherd not only counts the sheep, but the shepherd names the sheep. And it takes very, very little time for the sheep to learn their name. And they stick so closely to the shepherd that even when the shepherd whispers, they can hear the shepherd's voice. And finally, the third strong characteristic is seeing. Sheep depend heavily on sight, and they're very, very reluctant to go anywhere where they cannot see clearly. Their scope of vision is so broad, they can scan an entire environment just by tipping the side of their head. 
But at the same time, their depth perception is very weak, which means that even as they are walking along, they have to make it a point to stop and see so that they can see details. Sheep aren't very dumb, are they? And that's one of the reasons why followers of Jesus Christ are often referred to as sheep. And if we do not have these characteristics because of the Lord's precious Holy Spirit, he will sharpen those characteristics in us. Now, as I was studying for this, this morning, and like I said, this passage has been a part of my life for a long, long time. I've read it many, many times. I thought, this is going to be great. I can, I can just skip through this. And then God messed me up. Has God ever messed anybody up? Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. So now can we take a look at verses 37 to 39. When Jesus invited the sheep to come and enter into the kingdom of heaven, which was prepared for them even before the creation of the world. The righteous answered him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? When did we see you, Lord? When did we perceive? When did we discern that when the need was revealed to us that we were serving Jesus? A true saint, a true follower of Jesus Christ, as they grow in their journey, as we grow in our journeys, we get to a place where we are so overtaken and overcome by the love of God that it doesn't or even occur to us that we're doing anything special. We don't see the obedience and the love. One of the tricky aspects of this passage is that it is very easy to believe that we can work our way into heaven. And as we know from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And when Jesus talks about these works in this passage, it isn't the works themselves. But what it is, is that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we're committed to the Lord, there is a behavior, there is a lifestyle that goes along with it. Jesus promised us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we choose to submit ourselves to his work, we start to think differently. We start to move differently. We start to serve differently. But very often, on our own, we don't see certain things. We learned from Brother George that sheep have to stop and they have to see detail. And what we learn from the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, in the book of Luke, chapter 7, is about how he sees and how he wants us to see. 
This is the story of the woman with the alabaster box and the perfume. Jesus was invited to dinner by Simon a Pharisee. We don't know why Simon invited Jesus over to the house. But Jesus in accepted the invitation. And there was this woman in the town who heard that he was going to this man's house. And so she decided to crash the party. And she went back and she got her bo alabaster box that was filled with costly perfume. And when she came to the house, Jesus was sitting at the table along with the other guests and he was dining. And then this woman came along and she broke open her alabaster box. She poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. And she was sobbing. She was washing the dust off of Jesus' feet with her tears and with this expensive perfume and then using her hair to wipe them clean. Now, Brother Simon, when he saw the woman, he just, and he didn't even see her, he glanced at her and then dropped her in a category box. He said, Jesus does not know who's wiping and cleaning his feet. He must not be a prophet. He didn't see Jesus either because he dropped him in a box too. And then he said, this woman is a sinner. And because Jesus is both the great shepherd and the lamb, he heard and he read Simon's heart and mind. And he heard what Simon was thinking, and then Jesus spoke to him in a parable. And when he saw that Simon understood the parable about forgiveness, Jesus stood up. He faced the woman, and he asked Simon in 744, the word says, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I get to heaven, if I remember it, if I even care about it anymore, I am going to ask Jesus why swagger was not listed as a spiritual gift. <laughs> because truly, Jesus taught us swag. The Savior stood up from the dinner table. He rose and he turned to this woman who was very likely a prostitute. And then he spoke to Simon back here. Tell me that's not swag. And then Jesus began to read Simon while he was affirming, while he was forgiving, while he was loving on this woman. He said, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has has been forgiven little, loves little. Jesus stopped to see this woman. He saw her sin. He saw her conviction. He experienced her tears. And when he looked at her, you, I can just imagine how she was just, just basking in the love and the warmth of his affirmation, of his grace, and knowing that she had been forgiven. 
At the same time, the Spirit of the Lord was resting in her because even Brother Simon could not see he had the real deal in his house, that he had a real Savior in his house. The light of his heart was out, but the light of the woman's heart was burning bright. She stopped to see, and she understood the value of being at that dinner table, even though she was not even invited. She was in a category box, along with her Savior, Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be in a box, baby, I want to be in there with Jesus. Amen? <laughs> Glory to God. Seeing is so very important. And having the Spirit of God dwelling and active in us is so very important. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 reads, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God was poured into us, and Jesus pours it out all the time. And he has a desire to love through us. But this is accomplished through the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite, favorite bloggers, Jennifer Kennedy Dean, who is the co-founder of the Praying Life Foundation, said that the person whom the Spirit of God indwells has a spiritual ability to see. And seeing spirit truth changes one's perception of material facts. Spiritual vision gives us the ability to discern between appearance and truth. Our dear sister with the alabaster box appeared to be a sinner, but when Jesus looked upon her, she was redeemed. Because the love in her heart, the spirit of the Lord dwelling in her, opened her up so that she could receive her Savior and receive the forgiveness. But the great gift that we have through the Holy Spirit are the fruit of the Spirit, is the fruit of the Spirit. The late Reverend Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse preached a wonderful sermon on the fruit of the Spirit, and he talked about where love is seated in those fruit. Now, I need you all to repeat after me. Love is the key. Love is the key. Joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. resting. Long-suffering is, Long is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-forgetting. Gentleness is love's self-control self is love holding the reins. Is love holding the oh, that was so nice. <laughs> Amen. Whatever slice of the fruit of the spirit, it is rooted grounded and saturated in love. That is where our individual transformation takes place and that is how God uses us to transform whatever space he places us in. And when it comes to identifying the least of these, we have to have the love of God, and we have to be willing to be on Holy Ghost autopilot so that the Holy Spirit can reveal to us what we need to see, and then we can let him take over the conversation. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. 
And so we move on to verse 40. Let's read it together again. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So important. As I mentioned earlier, I am an urban minister, urban practitioner, urban bushwoman, whatever you want to call me, I love city ministry. And again, whenever a bunch of city folk get together, clergy or lay, we get into what is urban ministry. The best that we can come up with is that it is a metaphor. And we go on and on, we go around the table about what it is that we do in urban ministry. We have to be ready for anything because we never know who's going to walk through the door. We have to be patient because we don't know who's going to walk through the door. And when you have a city church building, you truly don't know what's going to happen. And you have to be cool. Now, frankly, I'm not going to tell you that I am always cool because I would be standing here lying to everybody in this room. <laughs> but we do the best we can. So one day, I was in New York City. I was there for an Urban Steering Network uh, meeting. And during a break, myself and a retired bishop and a seminary professor went over to this phenomenal Tennessee barbecue spot a <laughs> couple of blocks away from the church where we were meeting. And so we sit down, and yes, I had my ribs, my collard greens, the macaroni and cheese, you know the kind that leaves that yellow streak in the middle of the plate? If it doesn't leave a streak in the middle of the plate, then it is not real macaroni and cheese, I'm just trying to tell you. So we ended up, of course, having this conversation. And then we started talking about, the, you know, the seminary professor said, and you know, we are called to serve the least of these. And then we started talking about how we serve the homeless about our food pantries and our soup kitchens. We started to talk about the folks who are down and out and can't make it from paycheck to paycheck. And as they were talking and I was chewing on my bone, I started to think a minute. And I interrupted the conversation and I said, well, what about me? And they said, what about you? And by the way, you got barbecue sauce all over your face. <laughs> I said, yes, what about me? Because at this table, I'm the least of these. I'm not a bishop. I don't have a PhD. And if you're feeling lucky today, you can consider me to be the least of these because I'm a woman. What about me? And so they started to think about it. And the conversation shifted a little bit. And I'm speaking as one who serves in urban ministry. One of the realizations that we came up with at that table over that wonderful food was are we really focusing on our parish or are we taking a glance at folks and dropping them in a category? And then I began to tell them about the president of a firm, a consulting firm that I used to work for. And praise God for his grace because it's a miracle I was able to keep my job as long as I did. The president of the firm, we used to have, it was a small firm and we used to have these big meetings and of course the, the president would, would chair them. And then it seemed as though every time he was in a vulnerable moment, I was there. 
that's not good when the brother signs your paycheck. <laughs> so one day after a meeting, I go into the kitchen, and I'm on my way to a Diet Coke, and there he is. He's got cold cloths, and he's putting them on his face. And who sees him but me? So then I got out of there as quickly as possible, and I went to my boss, who was the vice president of uh, human resources, and I said, I just saw George in the kitchen, and he's always, every time he goes through a meeting, he's flashing his face. And she said, you need to stay out of the kitchen. And then she went on to say, you have to understand how intimidated he is when he goes into these meetings. Yes, he's the president of the firm, but he knows less about the industry we're in than the 25-year-old MBA who's sitting in that room. He feels intimidated by the fact that he's got the biggest learning curve. He does not know nearly as much as the people who are working for him. In that context, he is the least of these. This millionaire with all of these degrees, the one who signs our paychecks every month, is the least of these in that context. And when we're talking about the least of these, it is not only those who are without financial and material resources but it's those who are looked down upon, dropped in that category box by humankind. Sometimes we put folks in that box, and other times we put ourselves in that box. Now, as the body of Christ, we are called to feed, to clothe. We have done miraculous work in that area. My heart was leaping when that young brother talked about how many packets were packed yesterday. Susquehanna, give yourselves a hand. This is what we are called and charged to do because there will always be people in the world who have need. But I'd also like to take a moment to talk about that a little bit. And my time is running out, and I was praying I wasn't going to go over. Please bear with me, Bishop. I want to honor um, Grace United Methodist Church Harrisburg and uh, the Reverend Marcy Nicholas and all the leadership from that church. I am very excited to be appointed there. And the day that I was taken in by uh, Reverend Keller. You know, we heard from the leadership, and um, they talked about the Sunday morning breakfast for their neighborhood friends, which I thought was awesome. But there was a part of me, and I'm not going to lie, there was a part of me that was thinking to myself, oh joy, another meal for the homeless. And that comes from having spent so much time in urban ministry where there are so many of us who pat ourselves on the back because we have fed X number of thousands and we've clothed X number of thousands and we've given away X number of thousands of dollars in in bus passes. And when I served the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference as the urban director, after a while it started to wear on my nerves when I'd go to a church and they'd say, we fed 2,000 people this month. And I'd say, praise God. So what are the names of some of the people that you've served? You don't have to share names with me, but tell me some of the stories that you have heard from the people that you've served. And with how many of the folks that you served did you share your story? Jesus wants us to see. And there are times when we will never see the constituents that we are serving. We'll never see 
the people who are the beneficiaries of our ministry. But when God puts them in our path, We should be in a position of allowing the Holy Spirit to show us some things, to give us the patience to earn the trust of the people that we're serving so that we can develop the relationship that is going to bring the transformation. We should be tired of serving the same people over and over and over and over again. And in some cases, we have no choice. There are some folks who will remain in that situation. We will continue to serve them. We will continue to pray for them. But when God sends us somebody who has an ear to hear, and just need somebody to look them in the eye, call them by name, and smile at them like they are a gift and not a burden. That's when we are really ministering to the least of these. But at the same time, we also have to be very careful about taking a glance and dropping in the category box. And I'm preaching to myself too. I am not exempt from this myself. But I want to share another quick story and then I will wrap it up. When I was in my very first appointment, it was in a, in a very small community in uh, northeast Philadelphia. I could walk the perimeter of that neighborhood in an hour and a half. And there were a couple of Sundays where there was this young woman who came in. I didn't know who she was, didn't know where she came from. And I'm going to call her Terry for this morning. And she just kept coming to church. I would try to preach a message and stand at the door like good pastors do, and I would hug everybody who comes in or goes out if I can catch them. And then one day, I was going through my email, and I came across this one email that had no subject in it. And normally, I don't necessarily, I'll put that on the, bottom of the priority list to open. But this particular day, I opened it up. And I saw this long message, all in caps. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I do now? <laughs> this person is yelling at me and I don't know who it is. So then I braced myself and I read the letter. I read the email note. And then shortly after that, I got a phone call from a member of the church. He said, I was hoping I could catch you before you read the email note. Gertie just left my house. I had to help her to write it. And no, she's not yelling at you. She just wanted to hit the cap lock key and just do the thing. I said, okay, praise the Lord. So then, then this member started to tell me a little bit more about this note. And in the note... Gertie, who was 84 years old, said, I just want to thank you. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. She said, my granddaughter has been coming to church for the past few weeks. She has been wrestling with depression for a long, long time. And when she came to church the first time, she sat and she listened. And then as she walked out the door, you hugged her. And she said, and she liked coming in. She got this warm feeling when she came to the church. And this is a tiny church. This is like a, this is a 20 to 30 person congregation. And then she said, and finally you talked about forgiveness. And she cried through the whole service. And I didn't know, I remembered the woman crying, but I didn't know who it was. Now, Terry is a, or was a registered nurse, late 20s, beautiful, athletic young woman. And she comes from a good family, big, messy family, 
where everybody stays married for 40, 50, 60 years. Terry's marriage lasted two years. And she lived in that teeny tiny little community. And what the other member of the church did not share with me was that she had attempted suicide three times. And glory to God, she never completed it. But the place where she found her freedom was in the message about forgiveness. And truly, there is nothing I can boast about. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. But one of the things that, that had moved her is not so much forgiving and releasing other folk. We have learned so much about forgiveness. Even when we struggle with forgiving other people, we have a general, many of us have a general understanding that we need to forgive other folk. But the one that we, many of us, and I am high on this list, I know for myself that the one that I tend to be remiss in forgiving is me. Things that God had already cast into the sea of forgetfulness years ago, I'm still holding on to them. And that morning, we talk not only about forgiving other folks, but forgiving self. And this woman had been glanced at, and she was one of the least of these. She was hungry, but she wasn't hungry for a hot meal or the contents of a pantry bag. She was hungry for a word of life from the living God, even though she didn't know it. She wasn't thirsty for a bottle of water or a bottle of Coke Zero, but for the loving presence of God. She was naked and exposed by the shame she felt from her divorce and her suicide attempts. And her cell was not in a physical prison, but it was the unforgiveness she held against herself. Every so often we need to remind ourselves and remind each other that forgiveness does not stop with everybody else. We need to forgive and release everybody else and in our self-examination when we are experiencing the sin of guilt, we need to dip into the well of God's grace and forgiveness and say, Father, because you have forgiven me, I choose to forgive myself. And lay folk, you don't, it's not about preaching a message. Because let me tell you, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, it was through a lay person. Those times when I was so dejected and depressed and ready to give up, even on ministry, it was lay folk who said, Girlfriend, you are not the center of the universe. You are God's vessel. You quit when he says time's up. It was not a preacher who told me that. When we feast on the word of God, when we become so close in relationship with Jesus Christ that when he whispers, we can hear the sound of his voice. When we're so surrendered to the Holy Spirit that we put him on autopilot and we allow him to grow the fruit in us that is deep, rooted, saturated, soaked in God's love. We can not only see the least of these when they don't look like who we think the least of these are. And when we put ourselves in that basket, we can remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace is not wasted on me. And then when God puts the least of these in our midst, 
the love of the Holy Spirit will take over. And we will be able to speak a word of life. And we'll recognize that even when we're speaking to the person in front of us, we have the opportunity to impact multiple generations. It is not just that person. If we can minister and speak life into that person and make a decision to walk alongside them if they allow us to do that or pray for the next one whom they will allow. We not only have an impact on them, but on the people at their home if they have one. The people in their circle of influence, the generations that are yet to come. Finally, I want to close with a quote from one of my United Methodist heroes, the Reverend Dr. Alan Rice. Dr. Rice is the executive director of the Rural Faith Development CDC. He is the national United Methodist representative for the Circles Initiative to Eliminate Poverty. And during a service, he said, wherever you find the poor, there you will find Jesus also. Poverty is not limited to material and financial possessions. Every one of us is a victim of poverty. There is something in us that leaves us poor, which is why we need Jesus so much. And in the Circles Initiative, it is not about reaching down and pulling up. It is walking alongside. A circle leader who wants to come out of poverty is invited into an authentic friendship with an ally who is a person who walks alongside them who may be middle class, upper middle class. And they think through and they journey together. And that ally understands through this relationship that even though they have all the stuff and the status, that there may be a gap in their self-esteem. They may not have a strong sense of their identity. They may not know Jesus Christ as their savior or even understand what goodness is. And so both lives are transformed because of this mutual journey. And it is with the intention that it is not just the current generation that comes out of poverty, but it is every future generation that comes out. Who are the least of these? Who is the Holy Spirit revealing to us? And when is it that we become the least of these? Jennifer Kennedy Dean said, why do we need spiritual vision? so that when we look at situations on earth, we can see them as they will be when brought into contact with God's power. When we believe in his power, when we believe in, the God, in God, the Holy Spirit, and want to become more like Jesus Christ, when we see, we're not just seeing the present and the carnal, but we're also seeing the eternal. And we're seeing it with an intention of bringing it into contact with God's transformative power. Who are the least of these? And as we continue to be transformed, God will transform through us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word and for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask you to challenge us to pray that we will see with the love and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Father God, that we begin to see and not just glance and categorize, but that you open the eyes of our hearts and reveal to us what it is that you have called us to do. 
And Father, we lift up all the least of these, Father, whether they are persons who are living outdoors, whether they are the hungry or the imprisoned. Whatever their circumstance, Lord, whether it's spiritual or economic, we ask you, Lord God, to help us to be faithful, loving, affirming servants so that when people see us and hear us and receive from us, even if they don't understand it, they will know that we are your redeemed. In the name of our true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray, we thank you, we adore you this morning, and amen.